Hey guys, I'm Joris, as Sam already said. Um, so I work at a pro as a product manager for Google. I've been there for about um, six and a half years or so right now. Uh, so quite some time. Um, of those years, two and a half as a product manager. I've also done sales and marketing in the beginning. Uh, I did a bunch of years of finance, and then I switched to product management. Um, I'm not going to be talking about those switches in my talk, but feel free to ask me questions about it if you're interested in those kind of switches. Um, a bit of background, I got a, a master's degree in economics that I got in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I've been coding as well for uh, a lot of part, a big part of my life, uh, mostly as a hobby. Um, most recently, I've also started taking grad courses in artificial intelligence, which is obviously a very hot topic, but also very interesting um, to, to learn about uh, at Stanford. So I'm going to be talking about emerging markets specifically. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is probably going to be applicable to anything you do in product management. Um, but emerging markets, that's, that's what I've been doing over the last two and a half years, uh, a strong focus on, on that area. So uh, it's what I know most about, so might as well talk about that. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about two different things. First is why emerging markets. Um, I've already given that talk here previously, but I saw that almost nobody was here uh, for the second time, so uh, that should be fine. Um, and then I'm going to talk about Files Go, which is an app that I've led over the last year or so uh, that we've recently launched, and uh, going to talk about the things that I learned building that, launching it, uh, growing it, all those kind of things. So first, why emerging markets? Um, so internet growth is happening everywhere. And uh, this is actually not, even not that great of a statement because I'll show you where it's actually happening right now. This is the current or like 2016 total internet users uh, spread over the world. So these, the countries that are lighting up are the countries with most, uh, the, the most, the highest amount of internet users. Not percentages, these are absolute numbers. Uh, pretty clear, right? You see US, India, China, Brazil, uh, Nigeria is there as well. So that's kind of if you're talking about like where are the masses of people right now, if you're thinking about which, which countries to think about, it's those countries. Now if you, rather than looking at what's current, where the current users are, if you look at the growth, uh, you get quite a different picture. Um, China still lighting up, but you see one country lighting up very, very clearly, and that is India. Um, India is growing extremely rapidly, and the internet users, as we call it here, that are coming online there, they're not, uh, they're not necessarily people with a laptop or with a desktop, but they're people getting their first smartphone and uh, starting to use the internet that way. So every year, this has been true for the last couple of years and will be true for the next couple of years, India sees 50 to 100 million uh, new smartphone users coming online. Um, that's a big number. My the country where I'm from has 17 million inhabitants total, so this adds like well, five times that amount every year in terms of internet users. Um, so that gives you a sense of like, hey, why are we focused on India? Uh, or why are we focused on emerging markets? Um, it's where the big numbers in terms of growth are, in terms of new users. So yeah, if you, if you extend that a little bit to kind of the total uh, amount of uh, uh, smartphone users in the world, um, I think there's about two and a half billion smartphone users in the, in the world, more or less. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's that number, but around that area, um, more than a billion are already in emerging markets. Uh, and given that the growth is very clearly there, uh, very soon the majority, uh, and very soon after that, like the vast majority of smartphone users are going to be in emerging markets. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about just smartphone users in general, they're going to be in countries such as India much more than they're going to be in countries such as the US. This is really, if you're thinking about reaching the masses in terms of users, and the emerging markets are the are the countries to look at. Mm. So just to clarify emerging markets a little bit more. Um, when so we focus on India because as you saw, like that was the big country lighting up, and that's where the, the huge amounts of people um, 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 are coming online every year. However, if you extend it, India is only like depending on how you define it, maybe twenty percent of the whole. Um, emerging markets group of countries. Uh, there's a lot of uh, mid-sized and smaller emerging markets. And if you add all of those up, um, they add up to a lot, a lot of people. And the big ones are obviously like Brazil, uh, Indonesia is very big as well, uh, Mexico. Um, there's a bunch of them that are pretty, pretty, pretty big. Um, but yeah, India is kind of an easy focus for us because it's uh, 
Uh, it's by far the biggest of those. So then I'm going to be talking a little bit about files go. Um, so before going into that, I think it's useful also to describe a little bit more what's different about people uh, with smartphones in India, in particular kind of those new users, in comparison to people in, uh, in the US, for example. Uh, there's a couple differences. Uh, one is they tend to have smartphones that on average are um, have lower specs, are a lot cheaper. Uh, you can buy a great smartphone for like $30. Um, so that's a, it's a very different type of experience. Uh, it's a lot slower, older versions of the operating system, uh, less storage, etc. cetera. Um, then there's also less connectivity. Um, connectivity is getting better very quickly. There's a, a carrier called Geo in, uh, in India, which is uh, providing 4G to quite a lot of users already. Um, but in general, you can, uh, it's, it's a very good assumption to take that uh, the internet experience there is going to be a lot more intermittent and a lot more costly, and people are going to be a lot more data conscious uh, than people in, in the US are. Here, we kind of make the simple assumption that uh, people will always have access to the internet. Uh, that's not the right assumption to make in India. Uh, you should kind of assume that people might have uh, internet access on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but perhaps not in the exact moment uh, that they might need it. Uh, so when you're building products, that's something that is very good, very good to be aware of. Um, other differences are, obviously, there's a high diversity of languages. Uh, India itself, I believe, has 20 plus languages. Um, and that's just one country of all the emerging markets. So uh, very quickly, um, whereas with kind of US and Europe, to a certain extent, you can get away with English, um, that doesn't work as much for, uh, for the emerging markets. So you, you got to think about a lot more diversity in terms of languages. So then files go, there's one particular uh, insight that we found that drove uh, us building this app. Uh, it's an app that we released eight weeks ago. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about the launch and, and the things around that in a bit. Um, but the kind of the insight that drove us to build this um, was this and very similar insights that we got from other pieces of research is uh, people in emerging markets and in India are running out of storage space all the time. And, um, I run out of storage space on my phone, which has like 32 gig of, or 32 or 64 gig of, uh, of storage on it. Um, but that's maybe like once a month or so, and I, I clean it up and it's okay. Uh, in India, there's a lot of people that have this problem every single day. So they can't receive WhatsApp messages, they can't install an app, they can't watch a movie that they want to download. Like, they, they run into issues with storage every single day um, uh, using their smartphone. So that's a pretty serious issue, and it's on a whole different scale than it would be an, an issue for us. So we built Files Go. Um, we kind of focus on three areas. One is already uh, one I already talked about. Um, we focus on cleaning storage, so help people free up their phone um, to to be able to download more stuff, use it more, um, make it faster, etc. It also allows you to browse files um, for people that don't have a laptop, which is the vast majority of people that, uh, that use our app. Uh, they store kind of all their important documents and all their files on their phone, which is kind of a, a pretty um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty insecure place to store all of your files, obviously, because if you lose your phone or it breaks, you lose it. But it's also, um, it also makes that kind of file management and finding your files, uh, viewing your, uh, your, your movies, uh, your music, etc., so much more important than it would be for us. And then there's one more piece, and this is something that you see in India a lot. It's extremely common behavior that we don't really know here. That's offline sharing. Um, so again, if you have like a big video on your phone and your buddy also wants to watch that video, uh, what we would do is we would like send him the YouTube link or uh, basically tell him where to watch it. Um, if your internet is costly and if your internet is slow, you're not going to want to do that every time. Um, so the solution there is to share these things offline. Uh, I have a video on my phone. I can pass it to you without making any connection to the internet. So those are kind of the, the three feature areas that we, uh, that we built into Files Go. Quick sidetrack, by the way. I've, um, so Files Go is an app that I've led end to end. Uh, there's also other apps that I've worked on, uh, such as uh, YouTube Go, which is a YouTube version for emerging markets, um, and some apps that never released uh, that I can't say much about because they they never got out. Um, but this is kind of the the biggest product that I've worked on end to end. So I'm going to talk about this because it's what I know most about. So we had a very successful launch. Uh, something I'm obviously very proud of. Uh, we launched in early December. Uh, we got a 4.6 rating, which uh, for Google apps is, in particular is very, uh, very high. 
Uh, we got more than 10 million installs in a month, which again, uh, 10 million users is quite nice of a base to start out with. Um, so we, yeah, we were all very, very happy. And I think to this day, the team is extremely happy with, uh, with where we are, uh, which, which is great for the motivation in the team and, um, and kind of looking back on the work we've done and seeing that it, that, that it worked out well. So now I'm going to talk about um, five things I learned while building this, uh, this app. And feel free to interrupt me, by the way, anywhere that you want to ask a question or want to know more about a certain topic. Um, these are somewhat random topics that I thought about uh, uh, that I had kind of top of mind that I learned. So I'll walk through those and, and tell you what I learned in these areas. Um, but if you have any other questions about the process, please feel free to ask. Um, globally, but not in China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good question. I, we're definitely like China. We're super interested to work with uh, uh, to work in China and to make it work for China. Uh, obviously, there's uh, it's, it can be a little difficult, um, but it's definitely something we're also looking at. How big was the team? That so it really depends on how you calculate team size. But in, in terms of engineers, I think we have. So pure engineering, maybe f it's really difficult to say, but I would say the whole team is like 25 people, but pure engineering working on the app itself would be like 10. Then we would have like five more that worked on that offline sharing technology, which is something that we use in our app, but also in other apps such as YouTube Go. Um, then obviously you have uh, things such as your QA team, your, your testing team, which is another uh, few folks that we have. Um, then there's marketing, there's uh, product management, there's the designers. Um, so I would say as a whole team, let's say 25 or so. Yep. So the thing you have launched this month or something? December, yes, that's right. Yep. But there are a lot of apps which do the same thing, like share it, for example. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So how do you deal with the competition? Like, what is the I'm difference between you and them? I'm going to talk a little bit about that, actually. Question. After yep. one month, uh, you had 10, 10 million plus users. Mm -hmm. Do you know the breakdown by emerging market? Hmm. 70% India, something like that. Yep. Um, I think uh, it's India, Brazil, Mexico, US. That's kind of the top four we have right now. So. Uh, with those demographics, was there anything that surprised you in terms of, oh, we're getting a lot of older people or we're getting young people and that wasn't quite what you thought? Um, anything that surprised me in terms of demographics? Not necessarily surprising, but it's very clear that your early adopters are kind of uh, men age 20, basically, right? Those are, that's, that's the early adoption, uh, adopter group. And you see your kind of share of women growing from uh, 3% slowly to 5, to 7, to 10, to 15. Uh, so that, that's a very clear demographic shift that we see. Um, beyond that, um, so we're getting more and more India focused in terms of our demographics. I kind of hadn't really expected that. Like I knew already, obviously, that India was a big thing, um, but I was kind of hoping, in a certain way, that it would be more geographically spread than it is. With some, some, it's not seventy percent, by the way, but I think about half of our uh, users are in India, which is a lot. Yep. Sorry. Mm hmm. So we got a lot of press. Um, we did. A, we, we got like the, all the big, um, the big global tech websites. Uh, they wrote about us, um, uh, like TechCrunch and uh, what are they called? Uh, the Verge. Uh, those kind of um, websites. Uh, we got a lot of local Indian press, like the, the kind of the major local newspapers wrote about it. Uh, we had this cool feature, which I'll also talk more about. Like I'm gonna talk a lot more about all of this stuff. Uh, but a cool feature that kind of really um, made for a great PR story in India, which a lot of media also, uh, Indian media picked up. Uh, we did a little bit of marketing. Uh, most of our growth came from organic, so like uh, newspapers, etc. cetera. Uh, but we also targeted some ads online to, to get more users in specific areas. Yep. And um, was this only an Android app? Uh, right now, this is only an Android app, kind of for two reasons. Um, one is uh, Android is pretty big in emerging markets, um, like a $30 phone. Um, it's, it's predominantly and it will predominantly be Android phones. Um, and the second thing is um, the th kind of things that we try to do. So cleaning up your storage, uh, sharing offline. Um, there, Apple has the AirDrop, yeah, but um, you can't really build a good 
cleanup app on iOS uh, because of some system restrictions. And you can't really build a good offline sharing app um, because the system already has it, which would be a good reason not to build it, and because of system restrictions again. Yep. For this offline sharing, they just have to be in vicinity? Yes, yeah, so it's like um, uh, 30 meter, so that's what, 100 feet uh, radius, yes. Yep. Mm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, I, I think like after two more questions, I'm going to go deeper into this because there are a lot of questions will get answered uh, as I go through the rest of my presentation. Uh, but we do have a researcher full time that sits in India. Uh, we have part of our QA team in India as well. Uh, we had one of our designers in India. Um, we actually had a small engineering team in India at the very beginning, uh, but that actually proved to be very difficult uh, for in terms of collaboration. Uh, but yeah, so we do have a certain amount of people in India as so. well. Yep. Did you think much about um, the, you know, trying to push cloud on these users? Obviously, that's a big push mm. for Google. How does that integrate with this, or is it very separate? It's, this is just local storage. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So my assumption would have been they're not big cloud users, right? Internet connectivity is limited, etc. Uh, but I was proven wrong by data. Um, they're ex like Google Drive is extremely big in India. A lot of people use it. It's um, the main reason that people use it is because if all your important files are on your phone, uh, as I already said, it's like pretty, it's pretty scary, right? Like you lose your phone and your everything's gone. So people use these kind of cloud backup solutions as safekeeping for important documents. Um, so there's something that's definitely on our mind, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna continue. I think a lot of questions will get answered here as well. So first about understanding your audience. It's kind of a, um, it's kind of a no-brainer, right, as a product manager, know your user. Um, but just um, to, to hone in how important it is, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We do a lot of research, and some things that we found that, that were surprising and that, uh, that helped us build a great product. Obviously, the first thing that I already said is that people run out of storage all the time. Um, if Without that insight, the product would not have existed. And because we know this, um, it's, it's a, a product that's extremely successful and gets a lot of users and gets talked about a lot. So that kind of insight was like, critical for us to know, to be able to know that there might be a product here. A second kind of random insight is um, uh, on a lot of street corner shops, you can go and you can, uh, you can pay the guy behind the desk and he will uh, clean your phone for you. So uh, he will take your phone for a few hours, he will delete some stuff, uh, maybe he does a factory reset, he uh, uh, deletes some apps, puts some other apps on it. Uh, some, some of these guys, they told us that they... Uh, put the phone next to the air conditioning for, for an hour, and, uh, <laughs> and then you come back and you pay him a couple rupees and you get your phone back uh, cleaned up. Um, and that is not like one, one guy that did that, that did that. It's kind of spread throughout the country. Um, you can find in every neighborhood, you can find uh, some, some shops that do this type of thing for you. Um, then another thing is people get a lot of good morning messages. Uh, it's a very, very popular phenomenon in, uh, in India. Um, I wasn't aware of this, and I didn't know this concept. Um, <laughs> so people, people in India use WhatsApp a lot. I actually use WhatsApp a lot myself as well. But it's extremely popular in India. And people tend to be on a lot of different groups with a lot of people on it. Uh, not necessarily all people that they know, but just kind of social groups. Um, and in all these groups, every morning, a lot of people will send a good morning message to kind of uh, right in the day, at the start of the day, uh, we tend to look like this. So it's a good. It says good morning. Uh, it has a little motivational text very often. A uh, cup of coffee. Um, so this is kind of a very kind of everyday thing in India. Everybody gets hundreds of these, uh, which was a very. It was another interesting insight for us because we actually built a feature for this. Because um, one thing with this is, if you get a hundred a day, your phone's gonna get full pretty quickly. So we build a machine learning feature in our app that uh, detects these kind of images and allows users to delete them in bulk if they want to free up space. Uh, and I was talking about a PR story that, uh, to your question. So this made for a great story for the press as well, right? Um, it's, it's, such, it's such a fun story, and uh, it's, it's so much fun that we can use technology to help users uh, with the problems these cause as well. So these are kind of just three random insights through research that like, I would have never been able to guess um, uh, myself. So then in ter um, how to do research, there's many different ways to do research, but um, in particular, if you're talking about users that 
are unlike yourself um, or like are in environments that are unlike yourself, I think going out there and talking to kind of you, the audience that you think your, your target uh, user is, uh, is extremely important and is something that has brought a ton of value for us. Um, so what we do is we go out there with the team. Uh, I go out there. We have a researcher that uh, joins us, obviously. Um, we have some engineers that tend to join. Uh, designers always love to join as well. Uh, so uh, we're going out there with like a, a small group of our team um, to India, for example. And um, then there's a couple different types of uh, research or interviews that we do. Uh, one type is field interviews. Um, this is the type where kind of I take a, like we write research questions beforehand that we want to ask to people. Uh, I take like a, a notebook with me. And I go out on the street, like to a market or to a mall or to a shop or whatever. And I just like walk up to people and start, start asking them questions and uh, try and try and develop an understanding of, uh, of what they do on their phone and, and uh, what they do uh, through that kind of means. Um, that can be super insightful. Um, you ask people like what apps do they use? Uh, what is the last app that they used? Um, how many images do they have on their phone? What is their favorite thing to do with their phone. Like you can think of a lot of different questions that might be, that might lead you to, to a better understanding. And this is indeed like we get a ton of insight from just talking to people, just being there talking to people. Um, people tend to be pretty interested as well. It's like, hey, what is this, this guy with his notebook doing here? Uh, so they, they like talking to you in general. Um, for a limited amount of time, I must add, um, I think they like to talk to you for like five or 10 minutes, then they get bored. This is kind of the general, the general thing that happens. Then they're like, yeah, okay, I've answered enough questions, and uh, they start doing something else. So that's kind of the the other part of research that we do. Uh, we work with an uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, do you continue this interview that you start developing the product as well, or is it just, is it just like an academy? Uh, it's a good question. So this is kind of what we call foundational research. Um, so we would do this to gain kind of a general understanding of a certain topic, right? Um, once we feel we have a pretty strong grasp of that topic we wouldn't necessarily continue to do that on that topic. However, if in the app we want to build out a new feature area uh, that we don't know much about, uh, so let's say we want to add chat to the app or something like that, uh, we would probably do the similar type of interviews focused around that type of topic. There's other type of research, which I'll talk about in a sec, that we do, conti uh, do continuously. Yep. Uh, I'm just wondering about the size of the target hmm. that Yeah, the sample size. That's a good question. Um, so what we do in general, and uh, it's probably not scientifically uh, correct, but we, um, on a specific question or topic, um, we try to get like 10 people or so to answer the question. Um, that will obviously lead to bias. But I actually think the, the most bias you get is from the location where you are, and not necessarily the sample size. So for example, if we do go to one mall and ask 10 different people there, that might be a specific type of people that lives there. Um, Specific age group um, might be male dominant, for example, uh, might be very urban rather than rural. So I think rather than big sample size, I think it's very important to try and get diverse uh, insights from a lot of different places. Um, and so the other types of interviews that we do at this stage is uh, recruited interviews. There we work with an agency and we um, ask them to recruit people. There's a lot of agencies to do this type of work. Um, we get like a, a tiny little office somewhere in India in a city um, and we have people come in. These are like completely random people, so it must be fun to recruit as well. It's like uh, the guy that's, that's like the baker or it's like uh, some, uh, uh, some student or uh, uh, a sales manager. Like it's just kind of a completely or, or like school kids. It's, it's a completely kind of random grab from society. Uh, they come in and uh, we interview them for an hour or so. Um, so they can't walk away after 10 minutes, which is great. <laughs> so we can ask them more questions and we can dig a lot deeper into certain subjects. Uh, what this also allows you to do is um, if you have a prototype of your app or like mocks or sketches of what you're thinking about, uh, you can test it with those people and you can get direct feedback um, from what you believe your target audience is. Uh, so these are kind of two types of research that we do uh, early stages. To your point, uh, things that we continuously do is... Um, for example, when we build a new feature, we try to test that with users before we uh, push it uh, push it live to to uh, to a global audience. Uh, so that's kind of something that we that we do continuously. Something I'm looking forward to very much right now uh, is a research effort that we're going to do in about a month from now, 
um, where we're going to interview a bunch of people that are that have been using our app for a month uh, and get insights from them about how they're using the app, uh, what they like most, etc. Because uh, despite us getting quite a lot of feedback, um, really understanding those returning users is, is pretty difficult to get at. So these kind of users that you're concentrating, normally people are not willing to give this, like, data, like information on So do you attract them by some vouchers or something? I, I would say that's not my experience necessarily. I think a lot of people are very um, like helping out, are pretty keen. Um, I think the agencies that we work with for the kind of those one-hour interviews, they um, they do give like something to the to the people that are getting interviewed, but it's just a very small amount of uh, of money, or it can be like a small gift. Uh, and people generally love to kind of travel from very far uh, to be part of this kind of uh, experience because it's something that they don't know and they're pretty excited about. That's what you mean about the emerging market. Fair enough. I have less experience doing research in the U.S., yeah. so that might be different. I think you're going to be paying a lot more money probably to get U.S. users uh, to interview. Yes. Um, then the final thing is immerse, and that's kind of just like try and get as many experiences, like local experiences, as you can. Um, so for us, the typical thing that we would do is we would go to like a mobile shop. Uh, we would buy uh, a $30 smartphone, uh, get recommendations from the shop owner, or and get our phone cleaned. We, we give the guy our phone, we pay uh, X amount of rupees, and he, he cleans the phone for us, and we see how that experience is. And so these kind of things, like trying to get the experience that uh, local users might, might get. Then once you're launched, this changes quite a bit, and uh, the type of insight and the type of methods you use can uh, switch quite a bit. Um, these are, for example, Play Store reviews. On the left is a good one. Luckily, the vast majority we get is good ones, but there's also quite a few bad ones. We have 100,000 reviews right now, so you can imagine there's not, not all of them are positive. Um, I've read a couple hundred of the positive ones. They get pretty boring pretty quickly, and you kind of get the gist of it. Uh, the negative ones, every time somebody writes a negative review, um, I, I have it set up uh, so that it goes straight into my inbox. So every morning I spend a, a couple minutes reading negative reviews about our app, uh, which is a pretty, pretty depressing experience every day. Uh, <laughs> But it's extremely useful to kind of get that intuitive sense of what people are um, are not super happy about in your app. So this is this is definitely a, a huge source right now of user feedback and of user understanding. It's just kind of the 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 the, the, the reviews and the feedback and the comments on forums uh, that people giving are are giving about our app. If possible, we also try to reach out back to these people. Uh, it actually proves quite difficult. There's a lot of different ways in which you can do this. Um, but it's pretty difficult to get to a good conversation, uh, I find, um, online. So that's another reason why I'm like extremely interested in, again, getting out in the field and interviewing actual people that are using our app, because um, that will get us a much better understanding still. Yep, question. Do you know where Eagle comes from? Um, it, we get the, I think the country is attached when we read those reviews. Because okay. I think it sounds like a lot of your research was done in India huh. with Indian people. Hmm. So that was probably something. Did you see that specific comment where it's too basic? Was that reflected in India or is that maybe a geographical specific? So this comment is actually something that we see quite a bit. Um, so we're focused primarily on cleaning storage. Um, we have file management capabilities in there, but they're pretty basic right now. Um, so we, we do see this as kind of a, that's, that's a comment that we would get fairly globally. Uh, but there are definitely geographical differences. For one, people from Russia tend to be more negative. You can see the average rating is uh, is a little lower, um, and we can also see like differences in the way that people use the app. We see, for example, that uh, people in India use offline sharing quite a bit, whereas in Brazil, uh, much less so. Um, That's just one example, but there are definitely geographical di uh, differences. Yeah, question. Do you have already any tools, or are you trying to build any tools, uh, NLP tools, which can only give you yeah, it, it is actually possible to read all the negative ones because the, the volume of them is not so big for us, so that is possible, but you're right about reading all of them, that is not possible. Uh, we have NLP tools that do this for us and that give us a kind of a sentiment analysis, those type of things. Um, I don't really use them, to be honest. I don't find them that insightful. Um, I find that they miscategorize quite often. You kind of lose the subtlety of the of the comments. Um, so yeah, we have those kind of tools, but I'm not a big fan of it myself. Yep. So if your average rating wasn't four and a half stars, then the volume of negative would be higher. Sorry? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, we're lucky that. The <laughs> how would you manage that situation then? 
if, if, so we have internal to Google uh, a customer support team that helps with kind of analyzing this type of thing. Um, I think given that the majority of our reviews are positive, like they're not doing that much. I think if at Google uh, we would launch a product that gets a lot of negative reviews, the customer support team would probably shift uh, their focus and uh, help out on that a lot um, to kind of understand it better, reach out to users more, etc. Yeah, so that's, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, we would spend a lot more time, uh, both our team as well as the customer support team, on uh, on the reviews if, if most of them would be negative. Question? Um, yeah, so in the future, do you plan to do research outside of India, or yes. do you plan to localize the product further? Yeah, so question is, if, if we uh, want to do research outside of India, I definitely want to. Um, so to be honest, like I was a strong advocate all the time of like, hey guys, let's look broader than India. It's uh, it's kind of the same as building building a product for first world users and looking only at the US, right? So I say like, yeah, let's look at other countries as well. Uh, somewhat unfortunately now, like the bulk of our users are also in India, so that kind of pushes us to India again. Uh, but yeah, for, I'm for example very interested to see to understand usage in Brazil better. It's a very big market for us as well. And behavior and market dynamics, etc., are completely different in Brazil. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope that we do research in Brazil as well, pretty soon. Yes. So, what is the difference between Brazil and India? Uh, so the difference between Brazil and India. I can call it like so. I want to do research to understand it better, but I can call out a couple ones that I know. Um, one is uh, there's more Wi-Fi availability in uh, in Brazil. Uh, two is people are not familiar with the concept of offline sharing. So that's not really something that they do very much. Um, three is in terms of storage cleanup, I think Brazil, they like it even more and they do it even more than people in India do it. Um, good morning messages, I don't think they're a thing from Brazil. <laughs> so <laughs> even though uh, our designer, our design lead is uh, is from Brazil uh, and he has sent some, uh, uh, I forgot the word for it, but he has sent some Brazilian Portuguese uh, good morning messages as well, but they tend to be more rare there. So yeah, it's a, the, those are kind of the differences that we know, but we want to do research to really understand uh, Brazilian behavior better. Yes, question. Um, you shared your problem statement. Um, how did you identify that? Did Google say, we want to do something in India, um, find out what we should do, or did they say, we want more adoption, or we want more customers, or we want to drive eventual engagement with the brand? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, how did we define our, pro uh, our, uh, our problem statement? Um, so I think this would be different in many different scenarios, right? But the way it went for us is um, we wanted to spend more time focusing on emerging markets. Um, so there was kind of a strategic effort that formed around that within Google. Um, then what happened within that strategic effort as it kind of grew is that there was a, a big demand for uh, ideas. So there was a, we had a long list of ideas for different products um, and different kind of market analysis that led to us thinking there was a product there. Um, and so I was one of the people, back then I was in finance actually, I was one of the people that came up with kind of a market analysis around the way people use files on their phone. Um, and that kind of started gaining traction a little bit. The, the head of emerging markets, he uh, told me, um, why don't you do more research on it? Uh, why don't you work together with a designer and with an engineer to see uh, if you can build a prototype and see if there's something here? And that kind of started rolling uh, that way. So for us, it's basically like, one, uh, we want to focus on this as Google because a lot of the users are going to be there. Two, um, everybody share your ideas. And then three, um, see if you can get these ideas rolling. And the ones that show promise, uh, we're going to go forward with them. I have a related question. Yes. So when, when you uh, look at market insights, hmm. do you share that with the other uh, products that are being developed? If they're also working on any other different app? Are you, are you pulling all of your market insights? Yeah, definitely. Yep, we share. I mean, so right now we're at the Emerging Markets Organization is, is, is pretty big, so we don't share all the research all the time anymore. Uh, but we have mailing lists um, for research where, like, if we would do a big research report, for example, better understanding, uh, I don't know, good morning messages, I'm just saying something. Um, and we get a really deep understanding in that. We have a 20-page report, a uh, 20-slide report. We do slides in the know. Uh, we would send it out to the to the mailing list, and people could read it. Okay. Um, one other very 
a thing that you can do after you've launched that you cannot do before you're launched is uh, data analysis. Um, this is definitely something that uh, I find very useful as well. Uh, understanding which features are being used, for example. Um, you can get a very clear insight into uh, this is the stuff that people use, this is the stuff that people use less. Um, it's also very important that you make sure that you get this right and you get all your kind of logging right before you launch your app. Uh, we didn't do that. <laughs> uh, so we had some things that were lacking. So it took me until last week, basically, to understand what things in our app were actually being used and, and what things were not. Um, so that's kind of, a, for me, a very clear insight that I'm taking with me for any uh, future product that I built. Um, even though during, like, at a few weeks before launch, like logging is kind of the last thing you want to think about. There's so much going on. Uh, making sure you get that in good shape is going to be extremely valuable to you uh, the months after. So this is kind of a graph that just shows for different features. I didn't mark the features, but uh, for different features, how many people are using those features. Can you comment on what the red one is? Um, I think it's, uh, I would have to guess, I think it's people taking an action on files. So like deleting a file or sharing a file, those kind of things. We only look at this, we can only look at this in like bulk. So only when like a thousand users or so do take a certain action. So you only get like the high level picture, but it still tells you quite a lot. Yep, question. The most critical activity that would have been most difficult to do uh, without the funding? Whew, good question. Um, I would say the research probably. Uh, like, so the, what I talked about previously, like getting an understanding of the user. Um, so I think you can do it, to be honest, I think you can do it pretty cheaply. Like if you fly three people out to India, you can get a ticket for $1,000. It's not super cheap, but it, it's still kind of doable. Um, staying there is not going to cost you a lot. Um, and you can stay there for a long time at very low cost. Maybe you can Airbnb your, your own apartment and uh, you, can, you can pay it off. Uh, so I think making sure you do the research and um, uh, spending time and effort on that, that I would consider most critical and was definitely made easy for us uh, by having Google uh, behind us because we have a researcher that does it full time that can help us. Um, there's a lot of things to get arranged uh, and, and get made easier for you. Um, so yeah, that will be my answer. All right, second insight would be uh, focusing on a big need. Feels kind of like, a, I think it's kind of another very obvious thing, but uh, we've definitely built products which didn't really focus on a big need, just sounded cool or felt cool or felt like something new. Um, so the thing with storage cleanup is that it, it's such a tangible thing and it's such a clear problem that people are having. Uh, that is a big need. Um, one discussion that we've had a lot is how many, like, is it bad for your product to have multiple kind of purposes, to have multiple feature areas, etc.? cetera? Um, there's a lot of debate around this. Uh, the, the, the jury's out, but there's clear, uh, there's clear products that are extremely successful that do like a hundred different things. Uh, WeChat, for example, I believe is the one of the most popular, if not the most popular product in China. Um, they do messaging, they're a wallet, uh, you can book your doctor's appointment through the app. Um, it has augmented reality or they're working on augmented reality. So it, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in kind of one product. Uh, then on the other hand, you have like products such as a, a notepad or something, right? Which are extremely focused on doing one thing and doing one very simple, narrow thing very well. Um, this is, yeah, may not seem like such an important thing, but this is something that we think about a lot. Um, should you focus on one thing or is it okay to kind of uh, diversify a little and do multiple things? My, Takeaway that what I've learned from doing a couple of products is <coughs> I think it's okay to do a couple of different things and probably even good um, because you make your app more useful. It has like more use cases. Um, however, you definitely need to focus on one thing that is a really big need, something that people really, really care about, which for us is storage. Um, and so that need can be technical. Again, for us, it's people having storage issues. It's kind of a technical type of problem. Uh, it can be more psychological, right? Like social interaction, messaging apps or social networks. Um, that's the need that they fulfill. Uh, it can be financial as well. Uh, saving money, making money can be a big need for, for people. So I don't think there's kind of one answer to what that need, what type of need it should be. Um, but I think it's very important while you're developing your product. So ask yourself, like, is there kind of a, 
a critical need that I'm a critical problem that I'm solving for uh, for people with this, with this product. Uh, a third thing, again, not entirely scientific, but this is something that I believe in and I've seen work very well for our product, um, is add some joy and reward to your product. Um, we're all kind of emotional beings as humans, and I think it's very easy to get people a little more attached to the product that you're building by making it a, making it a fun experience, something that has a little character, etc. Uh, so this is something that, that we've definitely focused on a lot, and in particular, in comparison to a lot of Google products that take a bit more of a functional approach, we've definitely also uh, put a lot of uh, thinking and, <coughs> and effort into making it more of a kind of rewarding experience. Um, very closely related to that is um, celebrate achievements. Uh, it's another one of those kind of uh, emotional things that um, the main purpose of over app is to delete things uh, that are on your phone which is not that great to do, right? It's like, damn, I'm never gonna see this thing again. Do I really wanna delete it? Uh, so it's kind of an anxiety-inducing thing when you go through that step process. Um, so what we do is after you've taken a decision, okay, yeah, these things I'm gonna delete, um, we really create a moment there to celebrate that you freed up a lot of space and um, it's, it, was, it, it brought you a lot of good stuff. Um, and I think that works really well. It's, it's very clear in our app. Um, yeah, what's your question? Yes, I'm giving you an example in one sec. Um, so it's very clear in our app, um, you guys should, ch should try it if you haven't, um, that this kind of brings, uh, it brings quite a bit of joy and fun um, to, to do something as kind of anxiety inducing and boring as uh, uh, freeing up space on your phone. So this is the example that we do. Uh, um, these are overlays that we do on the screen where, you, where we show how much uh, megabytes you freed up. Uh, we show little animations uh, that kind of bring a little bit of joy to that moment of, of freeing up space. Um, and f f our engineers were extremely skeptical about this initially. They were like, ah, oh, what what why are we doing this stuff? It's not important. It doesn't help people free up more space. Uh, but kind of the design team in particular like hammered on it and really wanted to have this in there. Uh, and it's done a lot of good for us. Uh, and the, the engineering team is definitely also uh, bought into this now and uh, very much on board and, and loves this kind of stuff. Mm. Measuring the impact is definitely qualitative. So through research, through interviewing people, seeing the comment, type of comments that we get, you get these type of comments as um, great, like uh, it's, it's, it's so much fun to, uh, to be doing this. Um, obviously, it's not that much fun to clean up space on your phone, right? So that, that's clearly from these kind of things uh, that we get that type of feedback. Yep, question. How do you monetize? Uh, monetization is not necessarily something that we're focused on right now. Um, I, for us, and I think that's a general thing in tech, um, a lot of companies focus on growing first. Once you have big scale, you try and uh, see what, what monetization strategies might be. Uh, so we might start thinking about that over the course of the year. Right now, it would not be our focus. And I think even from a financial perspective, it would be um, kind of the wrong decision to make to try and monetize at this point. I wouldn't say so. I think any, um, if you look at any startup out there uh, that are trying to build consumer products, I think there's very few products that would try to monetize from point one. Um, there's big companies out there that are still losing a lot of money and don't have their monetization strategy in place uh, that are doing very well. Think about some uh, ride-sharing companies, for example. Um, so I think the, a general strategy in tech is first get to a big user base. Once you have that, there will be a lot of monetization opportunity. mentioned the uh, disagreement with the engineering team hmm. design and uh, just curious to hear about some of the challenges you might face during a project, huh. uh, dark days, uh, disagreements. Oh, that's an interesting question, dark days and disagreements. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about team in the end, uh, but this, uh, this I'm not necessarily going to talk about, so let me quickly address that. Um, so we've definitely had a period where we are focusing on kind of a different type of um, of like we positioned the app differently and it didn't work. Like it clearly didn't work. Um, we we lost some people on our team um, in, during those periods. Um, there were definitely a lot of people that were not very motivated. Um, so how do we handle it? Yeah, I guess like staying positive, trying new things, kind of accepting and acknowledging like failure is always going to be part of the process. Um, 
but yeah, it's, that's never, those things are going to be part of the process and they're never going to be great. Um, we make it very clear like in our team strategy and like in our team meetings that uh, we should expect to fail and we're going to try a lot of things. We're never going to be entirely sure if they're going to work um, and kind of have an expectation that a bunch of things that we try are going to fail. Um, that's, that, I think that kind of that going into the process like that will definitely help you a lot. One more question, yes. On the, on the related note, you also said that there are like a couple of apps in the next billion unit that mm. didn't see the light of the day. Yes. So how did you decide not to like like spend good time after bad time and like actually shut the project down or something? Okay, so why did we shut down some other projects? So I worked on uh, I worked on one product that, that never saw the light of day. Um, it was very clear from kind of when we started testing. So we went out to India and we started testing this with like a thousand people. It was just very clear that it got like zero traction. Uh, people didn't really get it. After two weeks, nobody was using it anymore. Um, so it was actually a very easy decision to make, to be honest, because we knew like if we're going to launch this, it's not going to work. Um, it was difficult, like at what exact moment are you going to make the decision? And that I think caused a lot of confusion within the team and we could have handled better. Um, so um, at the first time that it doesn't work, you can say, oh, it's just because this and this and this needs to be improved, right? Uh, so you try that and then you try a second time and it doesn't work again. You see like nobody's using it. Then you ask yourself, okay, wait, are we going to like spend two more months building this and this and this to see if it works? Or is this the, period, is this the point where we're going to say, we just don't have the, uh, the the thing that we're trying right now is just not going to work. Um, so that is just it's an extremely difficult question to answer. For us, I think after about let's say um, after some like two to three months of like being pretty sure that what we were building wasn't working, uh, that's when we made the decision like we're going to make a pivot, we're going to try something else. That was, by the way, that is very closely related to your question. That was a difficult time. Um, it's, it's just not fun for anybody to be working for a year on something and it, you see it doesn't work, right? So who, who makes the call to end up in the cloud? Uh, I would say the product manager makes the call. Um, obviously, kind of executives have to do with it as well because they spend... Uh, executives are kind of like financiers, right? Like uh, investors. Um, so obviously, they spend uh, money or their team on doing something that they also believed in and they uh, they don't see it working out. And then PM says like, hey, let's stop this. Um, it's a pretty important question for them as well. So they'll have a big say in that too. Okay. Uh, four is network effects. Um, so this is, comes back to a question also that was asked previously. Network effects, so this is the thing where um, a product becomes more valuable the more people have it, right? Um, there's a lot of big platforms that have a big network effects that work very well. Um, I think, again, ride-sharing are typical apps that have big network effects. Um, if you look at our app, storage doesn't have network effects. Uh, file browsing doesn't have network effects. Uh, offline sharing does have network effects. Uh, offline sharing is really only useful if everybody around you also uses the same technology to do offline sharing. Um, there's about five different uh, technologies out there to do offline sharing. and um, So this is a pretty difficult market. And you very, what you see, very interesting with, uh, with, uh, with offline sharing, is that it's extremely local. You have some cities where people use technology A and some cities where people use technology B. And that is kind of very clearly network effects in, act uh, effects in action because um, if, if I think that uh, if I'm in a technology A city and I think technology B is better, I need to convince everybody around me that B is better before it actually starts working for me. Um, so I think network effects can be, can be very much to your advantage uh, if you're one of the first to build the network. Uh, it can be very difficult if you're um, if you're coming into a place where there already are quite established network effects. So that is something uh, that I'm very aware of, in particular with offline sharing, um, where in some regions we see uh, it hasn't really taken off yet, and there uh, it might definitely be into, uh, to, to our advantage. In some regions, the network effects are very strong, and uh, it will be very difficult for us to, uh, uh, to get some usage there. How do we deal with competition? So we don't, and I think that's kind of also company philosophy, we try not to be competition focused. Um, it's very easy to kind of start looking at competition, see, see what they do, et cetera. Uh, but we try to stay super focused on the user. So um, how we deal with competition, we don't really deal with it. We uh, just kind of look at the user, see what problems they have, see if there's any open problems that we might be able to solve better. And that's what we will, will be uh, focusing on. But do you also check in your competition? 
<laughs> do we also check what, sorry? Are the case studies doing the analysis because people who complain what they don't have, that's what you do? Yeah, we also look at, uh, we definitely do competitor reviews. Um, however, um, they're not a very important thing that we do. It's kind of, um, it's kind of one report that we would generate at some point in the cycle. It doesn't really get looked at that much even. I would say like if you compare looking at competitors versus doing user research, we definitely do at least 10 times the amount of user research versus looking at competitors and uh, probably more than that. So I think, by the way, that's it. I also got the last time uh, I gave a speech here that um, people were pretty interested in how we think about competition. Uh, honestly, that's just um, that's just not that of an important topic um, uh, for us. And I think the right that's the right thing to do, in particular when trying to build new technology, is not try and look too much at competition because it all it will also narrow what you believe the solutions are. Question. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, how did you decide on those three features? Was thinking through the lens of network effect one of the criteria for choosing? Yes. Yes, definitely. So you're, you're asking, uh, was, were network effects, uh, one of the reasons that you focus on a specific feature? Definitely. We made a clear decision to, um, focus on a problem, the storage problem, uh, that did not rely on network effects. So it would be easier to, uh, to g gain a, lo uh, a large audience with. Yes. Okay. Final slide. Um, this is something that, um, so my background again is uh, I've done product management for a couple of years, but uh, before that did finance, a little bit of uh, sales and marketing. Um, so you have that kind of your skill set and you think you're pretty good at some things. I read a bunch of books about design. I did some programming. Um, but in the end, uh, your designers will know a lot more about design than you know about design. Your engineers will know a lot more about engineering than you know about engineering. Same with your researcher. Um, same with your marketing team. They will all like know a lot more about their specialties than you know about their specialties. There are some rare examples, right? Like if you're a marketeer and you switch to product management, you might know more about marketing than you marketeer, but those things are going to be pretty rare. Um, so that what the question that raises is, um, why are you the one making decisions? And <coughs> should you be the one making decisions? And uh, what is actually the value that you're adding in the decision-making pro process, given that so many other people uh, know so much more about all this stuff than you do? Um, what I kind of came to the conclusion is that a very important role that you can play is getting all those people together and having them kind of debate on certain topics and certain decisions. Um, and I use the word debate here because people like get pretty fierce about it. They have strong opinions. Um, and a designer will think about things very differently than an engineer will think about things. A marketeer will come in with a completely different angle. Um, and having those kind of debates and having people kind of passionately discuss what they think um, the right decision would be, what they think the focus area should be, etc. cetera, um, that I think is extremely valuable and something that, uh, that in my team I definitely try to encourage a lot and definitely happens a lot. Um, can be extremely difficult as well because you kind of want to make a decision at some point and then there's like everybody disagreeing and a hundred opinions going on. Um, but sort of the way that I think about this is you try and get all these people with their expertise together, uh, get all the opinions on the table, um, get them discussing all the different angles to a certain topic. Um, and then with all that input, um, you kind of sit down and spend another hour like writing it all down and then thinking through it and thinking what the right outcome might be given all the input that you've gotten. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I see the PM role very much as uh, somebody that... Um, gets the whole team together, gets all the opinions on the table, all the different uh, angles to a problem, uh, and tries to make a decision based on that. You also have PMs which um, trust their intuition more and which are kind of more, um, which will just say, I think this because of the things that I know from, from the past, so I'm going to make this decision. Um, yeah, I think, again, that it's, you shouldn't trust your own intuition too much. Uh, you, will be, uh, you will be wrong in a lot of cases. And I think you will start realizing you're wrong is as you get all these different opinions on the table and start thinking about topics a little more. Question, yes. Uh, now that you spent some time doing product uh, management, how has that changed your perspective of maybe what you had thought about in these types of products in your previous So how has product management changed the perspective of how I think about these products? 
for my previous world. Well, finance is pretty clear. Um, we were we were pretty interested. So uh, when I was in finance, we kind of had this thing where products that are very young and pretty small, we wouldn't bother too much with them. It's, it's kind of, they're still growing and they need room. Uh, but obviously, we would pretty quickly be thinking about monetization, for example. Um, and I now honestly believe that um, a focus on monetization too early in the process is, a f financially speaking, a bad decision. Um, so that's kind of definitely one, one way that I uh, started thinking about it a little bit differently. Um, then compared to sales and marketing, it's a little different because it wasn't as product related, uh, the stuff I was doing back then. Um, I think compared to marketing, it's, uh, you probably very quickly start to see marketing as kind of the main growth engine um, for the product. Whereas, for example, things such as referral features or business development or um, press releases, those kind of things can be uh, at least as big as um, kind of the more uh, traditional marketing efforts uh, might do for you. Um, so, yeah, taking kind of my finance and marketing hats, those would be things that I, I'd change perspective on a little bit. Question. So for your PM responsibilities, as you mentioned, um, can you tell me your experiences with over analysis of certain features or managing the team's over analysis? So by over analysis, you mean kind of doing too much analysis on a certain thing? Yeah, on a, or even a feature. Or yeah. you know how you mentioned the uh, the disruptive feature with the celebration? Yep. yep. That's something that could be easily overanalyzed if I were uh, looking at that. So what would you overanalyze? The decision or the data behind it, or what? What would you overanalyze? Even the debate. The debate. Well, you yeah. Mentioned the engineer, the one really got it. Yeah. No, I get your question. So it, it, not do it when you put. You have three designs, one design. Yep. No, it's it's a really good question. So how to not overanalyze things? Yeah. Um, so this is a balance, and it's a balance again that, for example, when when we talk about team strategy and our team vision, it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, you're never gonna have enough information to make a great decision. Like you're always going to have to make a decision on data that feels a little too limited. Like there's, I can hardly mention any decision that we've made where that was, was not the case. You want more data, you want more research, you want to ask users, you want to, uh, you want to get more opinions. Like there's always kind of more to learn before you make a decision. Um, yeah, the reality is, and I think that's something the PM also definitely has to do. After a certain amount of data, a certain amount of debate, Make a decision. Some people are going to disagree. There's always like there's always some people that don't agree with the decision. Some decisions, the majority won't agree. Uh, so um, just ma at some point, say we have enough inputs, uh, or we we've spent enough time on it. We got a bunch of inputs. It's time to make a decision because we're not going to delay this another three months to make this decision. It's I think this is an excellent question. Like this is such a balance kind of thing. Like we have engineers that get mad and they say like, oh, we didn't think about this decision too much. And they might be right, like maybe we should have thought that decision through more. Then there might be another decision where we delayed it for months because we wanted to get more data, more insight, and then in retrospect you're like, damn, we should have made the decision two months earlier. So it's a balance, it's, it's, it's a tricky balance and one that's very core to PMing. Yes, question. Uh, quick follow up from this yep. question making decisions. So even if you look at, if you look at the emerging markets, yep. even if you look at India itself, there's quite a bit, I mean, there's quite a bit of <coughs> diversity in the kind of market, yes. or even the type of user, I mean, yep. let alone language, user, and culture. Definitely, yes. So, uh, did it help to focus on a specific kind of, for example, you have the urban English-speaking um, yeah. in here, versus somebody from a smaller town uh, for whom English isn't quite their strong point. So, there's also the localization piece. So, is there a specific sort of typical user that the next one billion person has in mind, or... Do you also have to take certain payoffs? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, India is almost kind of a bunch of different countries together, right? Like it's, okay, <laughs> where did you grow up? Uh, I don't know. Okay, nice, cool. Uh, so we do, a, in India, we do a lot of research in a lot of different places to try and get diverse insights. Um, but we are definitely super focused on India. So there's a certain balance there, again, between... Um, uh, we don't necessarily have one person in mind. Uh, we have kind of this. Not, yeah, not even that. Um, so we have this personas slide that I have like in the in the in the product vision deck, and it has like uh, a, a house mom from San Diego and kind of a, a computer engineer from uh, Hyderabad, India, and a 
I don't know, like a student from Rio. Uh, so yeah, we don't actually have that that much of a specific person in mind. Uh, we do think about certain age ranges, so we're more focused on people uh, in their 20s and early 30s, um, because there's just more of them uh, that will be more of a typical user. Um, then there's kind of the trade-off between are we going to focus our research on men or are we going to also uh, do a lot of research on women? Early research, we focus more on men because those are the, the early adopters. Currently, we're doing research, which is uh, we're, we're going to have one research initiative, which is entirely focused on women. Um, so we don't have one persona in mind. Um, we diversify the, the type of insights that we get. Yes, question. Uh, question related to his question. So did you think about creating this app in regional language? I already thought this app is like so simple that you don't even have to do that to give it to people to use. No, we have it, and that's kind of one of the lucky things about um, have, being at Google. We have this app in 18 languages. So um, we're pretty well covered in India. Then again, even in India, there's a couple of languages that we don't yet support. Uh, but uh, we're definitely, local languages are a big thing for us. And uh, there's also this thing where, like, some people like to have a mix of English and Hindi, for example. Um, there's um, there's also this thing where we try and focus a little more on symbols because not everybody will be reading uh, will be reading as well. Um, so there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Uh, but the general thing is, yeah, we just we're lucky enough that we were able to translate it into a lot of languages. If we wouldn't be so lucky, then I would say uh, focus on English, but Make sure the symbolism uh, in your app is extremely clear. Yeah, how much uh, time do we spend catering for other parts of the world? Um, not that much. Um, to be honest, not that many things in the app are catered to specific countries. I would say that kind of the good morning meme detection thing that we did, that was fairly focused on India. But we also generalized it to say kind of any picture that is low resolution and has a caption on it that we consider kind of a meme. And that might be kind of the low quality kind of stuff that you get a lot of during a day that you might not need on your phone forever. Um, so we didn't, we didn't really localize. We tried not to localize too much and try and keep it kind of as broad as possible. Yes, question. A B testing. Uh, we don't currently. It's interesting because uh, I think people would probably consider Google like super data mined everything. We test if it's blue or red. A B. Uh, no, we don't do that in our app currently. Uh, we are thinking about doing that in the future. Um, I think this is a personal thing, and I might change my mind after we do A B testing. But I also think it might make you a little lazy about making decisions, where instead of thinking through what might actually work best. Um, you just try everything all the time, and you see you see what uh, what what you get the best um, uh, best numbers on. Um, so I think that it it might also make you a little lazy in your decisions. And I also I'm not sure if you can always make a decision based on things like CTR or uh, those type of metrics. That said, we we are going to do it. Yeah. In terms of like machine learning or. Mm. Yeah, so I, I don't really know what, what counts as automation and what does not. Um, but this is definitely kind of uh, something that we run in the background kind of to, to detect those images. Um, beyond that, not much, I would say, no. Yeah. Yep. I'm also wondering if there was again, a skepticism of this uh, new technology, because we come from a, like a third world country, you could say it. Using you know, the cloud as a storage is something that people are kind of reluctant to, to use. Mm. I, was, I was wondering if people you know, were so kind of insecure of trusting you, know, you guys to manage your folders. So um, so whether we're getting a certain reluctance about us managing our storage. Um, not really, to be honest. The thing in India is that Google has an, an exceptional reputation. Like People really, really appreciate Google, really trust it. It's, it's very highly trusted. Um, so people trust us to uh, trust us to do well with, with the stuff that's on their phone. Um, the other thing is there's also quite a lot of very untrustworthy software out there. Um, so it is, it is a... Uh, Kind of the the choice for users to use like a Google app versus something that 
is quite a bit more untrustworthy. It's it's it, it's a pretty easy choice often to make. That's a question. Offline sharing, did you consider piracy or aspect? Uh, whether offline, uh, whether privacy is a, is, a, is an aspect of offline sharing, um, we haven't dug too deep into it. Um, people share everything, and um, a lot of it is uh, uh, a lot of it is definitely uh, stuff that is um, non-pirated, uh, such as photos, videos they make, apps they make. Uh, some of it might be pirated. We don't really we don't ch check. Uh, we cannot check that locally. Um, it's kind of like a USB stick, right? If uh, if you put certain files on a USB stick, uh, yeah, some of it may be pirated. Some of it may not. Yes, question. Uh, how do you think of acquisition? Like the 10 million users that you said, were all of them like organically acquired, or did you do any like paid reference on an ad? Uh, so we did some ads. Uh, the majority is organic. So what we call organic is people finding our app through press or whatever and downloading it. Uh, but yeah, we did do some ads. Um, we might um, do some other kind of deals where we uh, where we're pre-installed on phones, for example. We don't have paid referrals. Um, it is something that we're interested in. Um, we're also interested to see if we can do something with referrals without paying for it. So having people kind of unlock certain things in the app, for example, uh, is not something that Google has done before, so that would be kind of a, a first, but that I think we, we're pretty interested to experimenting with that. Because it's very easy to kind of throw money at the problem to buy users. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try a lot of different things to see how we could make this work better um, without spending anything per user. Next question. So on the uh, decision on which different features to choose, it sounds like you did a lot of research as far as <coughs> growing markets are, where the market fan is, mm. and then you did a lot of specific research in those markets. Uh, but what I'm curious about is um, how did you decide on potentially any features that these potential customers didn't know that they actually wanted? So for example, if I go to Italy and I Asking a guy in Italy, what's your favorite food? And you say pasta and pizza. <laughs> he might not know what a hamburger is, yeah. and he might really like it. So did you, did you guys go into that, or was it more so choosing features that you heard about? No, 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 it's definitely, so your question is, are you going to look at what they currently use, or uh, how do you figure out, like, what might be something that they would use that they don't currently use? Yeah, what they would. Yeah, it's definitely the, focused on the latter. For, often you might end up with something that may be similar to something that's out there, but what we try to focus on is understanding the problems that people have. So really digging into that. So for example, the storage problem, uh, there's definitely a problem-based kind of thing. And we came to a certain solution to that problem, uh, which is there's other solutions out there to that problem, but they clearly take a very different approach to the problem um, than, than we are doing in our app. So... Um, yeah, we try and be super focused on the problems and the behavior and then see what what kind of new type of solution might uh, solve those problems for people. Um, whether or not that may be similar to something that's out there. Yes, question. Heading into the, into the previous question. Um, so yep. once you had the set of features, um, did you have a set of techniques for the process of elimination on what should be the priority and what might attract them even before the, the user um, process of elimination for what might be useful versus not. Um, how did we go about that? So we tried different things. Um, it became very clear very soon that this storage issue was just such a thing for people, right? Like the fact that they pay people in shops on a recurring basis to help them clean up their phone. So uh, even before the user study. Oh, before the user study. Yeah. Um, so I did market analysis. Uh, I looked at what are currently popular apps, um, what is kind of the typical phone that's being used in those markets, and you can see, oh, they got low space. Um, um, so th that type of analysis, understanding which technologies are available, which technologies are not. So for example, people do a lot of SD card swaps. Um, they buy a bunch of SD cards, they give them to their friends, they get them back, etc. cetera. Um, so kind of doing more of a higher level market analysis of what is currently happening. That kind of gave us this area of topics around files and then interviewing people, it became very apparent that this cleaning thing is something that people are paying money for very often. People care about it. It's fun. It happens every day. Um, so from those interviews, it became pretty clear that this would be something that we, that we should be focusing on. Yes, question. Uh, to start here, I think storage cleaning is also a feature that's offered by Google Photos, right? That's right. Uh, is that something that you guys thought of while you started uh, developing the app or did you feel like 
Um, yeah, Google Photos is definitely interesting, and it's something that's uh, like we're we're talking to them, etc. Um, so Google Photos focuses on one thing, and it's the photos and videos on your phone. Uh, does it extremely well, right? Uh, but it, that's not necessarily. Um, it's it's a share of the things that you have on your phone, but not. It's definitely not everything, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big share e- either for people in those markets. So for us, um, I think your question is your question kind of like. Did we, would we have decided not to do it because they already did it? Is that yeah, what you're getting at? No, no, not at all. No. Um, it was very clear to us that they were doing a subset of the problem. Uh, they rely extremely heavily on connection, which is not really available that widely uh, in emerging markets. Um, and also in general, that's, that's another thing, I think kind of a Google type of thing is, um, one product would not really hold back another product, um, to, to start developing. Even if there's overlap, um, we try not to say, hey, this product is this, so don't build that. Like everybody gets kind of a try at um, building a, building building something new and seeing if it, they can get it successful. There's there's by the way, there's some internal competition quite often as well where like app A and app B are, are doing something similar and obviously they want to do the best. Um, you could say that's a good thing as well because like it drives people a little bit. Yeah, question in, in the back. Yep. Oh, can I talk about the thought process? Is that your question? <coughs> yeah. Um, so for me, kind of the path to product, uh, been a long path if you kind of see the whole thing of it. Uh, so I, as a, in high school, I kind of was doing computer stuff a lot. Uh, like I had a bunch of friends that were all kind of, we did, we organized like LAN parties, um, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Uh, we, we, uh, we're programming quite a bit. Uh, at some point, we built a game, and like everybody, built like their own uh, little AI for for the different opponents in the game. Um, we didn't really get very far with it, but anyway, like we were always kind of messing around with those kind of things in high school. So back then, it was kind of a pretty clear, like the technology part was a very clear part of my life. Uh, then I did economics, which kind of gives you a very clear kind of business and high level society kind of view of things, a little less related. Uh, but then I came to the, I, I did my master's thesis on uh, open source software because I was still very interested in technology. That kind of made me want to go to a company like Google because I thought oh, there I can perhaps combine my uh, kind of the, the broader business type of views with uh, the technical um, excitement that I have. At uh, Google, I started in sales. It was kind of uh, the thing I, I rolled up into back in Amsterdam. Then I did that for two years. Um, I was in very close contact with the finance team who were doing very exciting kind of data analysis. So I like, started doing a lot of data analysis. And uh, after a while, I, I, I was able to join that team, uh, which was a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun working in finance. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, and then I moved to Mountain View at some point uh, to do finance for Android and Chrome. I was still studying kind of computer science type of topics on the side, building some little apps on the side. Um, and then I was like, well, um, Kind of the mix of stuff that I've that I've done and uh, that I like um, may set me up for uh, product management at Google. Um, at Google, it's not necessarily super easy uh, to get into. Uh, I think, in particular, for coming from finance, uh, it's not uh, it's not the most typical switch. Um, but what what got me into there, I was I was thinking I'm going to try this for a year. Um, so I did this kind of market analysis, and then I said previously. Um, the VP of the Emerging Markets Organization was got quite interested in the in the kind of analyses that I was doing. So we started kind of thinking about what could a product look like um, that I did kind of in my spare time next to finance. Um, and I started working with some other people part time. And as that slowly got rolling, um, like a, a small team started forming and a kind of a product idea started forming. And then the VP kind of just asked me, um, "Do you want to start doing this full time?" Because uh, as the team starts growing, you can't do this like in your evening hours anymore. And so that was my path into product. Um, one of many, right? Like if you hear stories about people, how they got into product management, there's a hundred different ways, right? Uh, I do think the one of the, one thing that's pretty typical, again, it's not universal, but it's pretty typical, is kind of an understanding um, and perhaps experience in business type of topics, can be marketing, uh, whatever. Um, an understanding and keen interest in, te- in technology, programming, for example, or kind of other type of uh, technical endeavors, um, and perhaps some experience already having built a small product. It doesn't have to be successful. I built some uh, 
very mediocre uh, products before, but uh, kind of having that a little bit of that experience as well, I think that makes for a pretty good package of rolling into uh, a product management role. Yep. Uh, I heard you mentioned that you're saying that you're going to try to uh, share the list. Um, so <coughs> there are already some things on your roadmap. Uh, there are engineering team facing issues, and they have to deal with that. There are requests from uh, uh, marketing teams, and yep. uh, there are always with user feedback. So how do you prioritize between all this? Uh, yeah, how do you prioritize? That's a very good question and extremely difficult. Um, I think uh, so a lot of people, they come up with ideas. They say, oh, it would be great if you do this. Um, you even have that with executives. They come to you with ideas. A lot of users come to you with ideas. Your team comes to you with ideas. So there's no shortage of ideas. That's never a problem. Yeah, I can easily create a list of 100 ideas for our product. Um, so the way that we try to prioritize or that I try to prioritize in my team is I try to set a vision if, of like the next few years where do we, what do we want to get to? What do we think uh, are big opportunities? Um, what do we want to evolve into? And that strategy is definitely a very important uh, guideline that, that makes it somewhat easy to, for us to, to pick the things that we want to go for. I think a second input there would be the feedback that we get from users and kind of the insights that we get from the market, where like if 50% of your user feedback is asking for feature X, uh, that's a pretty clear signal that there might be something uh, might be something there as well. So I would say one, trying to set a long-term vision, and two, um, uh, looking at what users are talking about. Yes, question. How do you guys come up with ideas for your next product? So how we come up with ideas? It's it's different. Um, so we have a strategy team. They come up with uh, they do market analysis. They do they they find opportunities. Um, we have um, uh, product managers that may come up with ideas by uh, doing analysis. Um, so it can come from a lot of different sites. Um, I think it's kind of the role of like an executive to say, of these things, um, these 10 I want to see if we can explore a little more. Then of those things that we explore a little more, these three are ones that we really want to invest in because we can see they, they're gaining traction. Does that kind of answer your question? Yep, yeah, question. Um, I had like so you mentioned about like for your early users who really targeting the males um, and between the ages of twenty and thirty. Um, yep. makes sense because they're probably the most active right now. Yes. So I'm wondering, you know, what about the untapped market? For example, yeah. like women, they represent half yeah, the yeah. population. But you know, typically they do have like few percentage of probably thirty percent of them like own a mobile phone, right? Like so how yeah. do you yeah, again, that's such a difficult balance. Like, we actually see our eventual target user as being probably more woman-focused because that there's a lot of, as you say, kind of untapped opportunities. A lot of products focus on solving kind of the, the problems for engineers, pretty much. Um, so there's there's a big uh, there's a big opportunity that we see in India in particular. Um, for uh, kind of the female uh, uh, groups. Um, we're starting to do specific research with just women, uh, trying to understand how they use file managers, for example. Um, obviously, women are a pretty broad group, but yeah, we're, we're definitely uh, more and more starting to focus uh, around how can we <coughs> reach that eventual group that we want to target beyond the current group of early tech adopters that we have right now. It's, but it's a balance, and this is also something that we debate a lot Different people have different opinions. Some people say, oh, you should build it entirely for your eventual audience. Other people say, um, first focus on that early tech adopter group because they're the ones that are going to like help you grow and that they're going to spread the word. So there's difference of opinions, and uh, I think the truth is in the middle somewhere. Yes, question? Are you considering having these features already embedded in uh, the Android when people buy it? Sorry? Do you consider uh, all these features for uh, iOS Go to, to be already embedded? Embedded in Android. Um, if they should be embedded in Android. So, so one thing is like Android doesn't really want to favor Google apps too much, right? They want to try and have a healthy ecosystem of a lot of different uh, apps from a lot of different developers having a great chance. Um, and another thing is Android is pretty um, 
kind of neutral, generic, and they have to be, right? They're for everybody. Um, if you think about these fun animations that we have in the app, um, I don't know if like, that would be like the perfect match for, for kind of vanilla Android uh, to be in there. So it gives us a lot of freedom as well to, uh, to do something outside of Android. Uh, that said, Android is also interested in, in some of these features. So yeah, there may be some amount of collaboration uh, at some point. Yes, question. Uh, most important KPIs, yeah. Um, very clear is uh, number of users. Uh, 28 the actives is what we what we look at. Um, very clear is uh, Play Store rating is an important one for us. It's like what the users think, right, in, a, in one easy metric. Um, then there is one for us specifically. Um, we look at how many people free up storage the first time they use the app. Um, if they don't, that's kind of a pretty big failure for us, right? Because like that's why they got the app. It didn't work out for them. So that's one that we definitely want to like keep as low as possible. Um, then there's other things such as how much space are people freeing up in the first 30 days? Uh, for us, that's over a gigabyte, which is a very good metric. It tells us that people are clearly freeing up a lot of space using our app. Um, and then I, I think feature usage, like uh, it's not necessarily something that we have targets for, but something that is extremely interesting to see is which features are getting used a lot, which ones are not getting used a lot. Yes. Um, so we get feedback. There's two ways we get like a lot of feedback. Uh, one is Play Store reviews. People are very keen to write their opinion uh, uh, on on apps that they use. Um, we got over a hundred thousand uh, reviews already, which is uh, feels quite substantial. Um, and we have a function in the app where you can provide feedback. It's just kind of, you, you press a menu and says feedback and you can write something and it, it ends up with us. Um, I think for the feedback feature, I would consider that to have quite a bit of bias. I think the type of person that, <coughs> that sends feedback directly to a development team, it's probably more of a tech savvy type of, uh, uh, type of, type of person. I think the place or reviews are a little less biased. Um, and then there's kind of outside sources such as we had a huge thread on Reddit, for example, uh, where a lot of people are discussing it. Uh, there are some other forums where people are discussing the app. Um, when we get press, so right, uh, The Verge or TechCrunch or whatever, or like Indian press, um, a lot of people leave their comments below those articles. Those can be very interesting as well, because in particular, if it's something like Economic Times of India, that's a pretty unbiased sample. Um, you're not going to get, uh, those are not necessarily early tech adopters. So, uh, a lot of different sources. I'd say play reviews is kind of the the one that we get most out of right now. Yes, Chris. So when when is it that you decide to focus on an emerging market product versus like a regular Android OS product? Is it is it during your visioning stage? Like what what is the process to get there? So um, how do you decide to focus on emerging markets? For us, to be honest, this was a company strategy. Um, kind of a new initiative, a new focus within the company was being formed, specifically around solving emerging markets issues. So kind of, um, I was very closely aligned with the organization in my finance role. And because of that, I very quickly kind of, I very quickly was in, in that path. And I think at Google, that was also very interesting because we are always focused on kind of solving problems for people that are fairly similar to us. Um, we try to diversify, obviously, but uh, that are, somewhat similar, um, and this is something that we didn't do before, so also the kind of the Google product opportunities yeah. there were a lot wider um, and a lot less was explored, which made it easier in a way to find great opportunities. So if you've established, say, 10 million users, I don't know what number is in the emerging market, hmm. if you launch another app that they might use, how do you leverage that? Or did you already do that to get them in the first place? So yeah, how do you mean? I don't. If you have 10 million users in emerging markets, yep. and you launch another app for emerging markets. Yeah. How do you uh, get them to adopt that quickly? <coughs> do you go to the same press, or do you go directly to your users? Yeah, it's a good question. So we have a bunch of different apps out there uh, out there right now for emerging markets. We have uh, Taste, which is a payment product. Uh, it's just India. We have Detelli, which is a data saving product, um, global, I believe. Uh, then we have our app. We also have uh, Google Station, which is a uh, Wi-Fi connectivity at uh, train stations, in primarily in India. Um, 
So one thing that we had is we launched our app very closely to Detelli, for example, which made it a little more difficult to get the right kind of press because there was too many things happening at the same time. Uh, but normally, um, I think tech is pretty keen to write about new products when they launch. Um, and in particular, if they're solving like a specific issue for a specific group of people, uh, such as Google building something for India, um, it doesn't really, I think it doesn't really matter if you launch another app a year later. Uh, people will be interested in uh, in what you do. Well, you just grow organic every time. Um, yeah, so we we get quite a bit. So we get quite a bit of press around it organically. Um, however, I th like I definitely want to make sure next time I launch an app that like I take a moment where there's no other apps or no other big technology releasing, so that press doesn't have too much else to write about, and they will focus on us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Sorry, question. Yeah. I'll get two more. Okay. So, so what does Pyzo do for the for Google in general and like the next billion unit is perfect? Like, I understand Google is being like the play into like the payment space. Mm. It's also revenue generating at some level. Yep. What does Pyzo do for Google for next billion for its users? Yeah. So the, um, that's kind of more like the monetization and the, and the value uh, pieces of um, uh, of files go. Again, it's not something that we're laser focused on right now. First, we want to build a bigger user base. Um, there's definitely a bunch of things that we can do. So, for example, there's other monetizing Google products that we could uh, help acquire more users. Um, there might also be monetization opportunities for us ourselves to start generating some revenue. Um, we're starting to think through these, uh, starting to work with our finance team, which is obviously interested in that as well. Yeah. Um, those need to evolve over the year, and there's like Google is definitely like executives will be interested to also see like, hey, um, great, you got traction. Um, at some point, uh, how are we gonna um, add value uh, for Google? So that is a good question, and we're going to answer it. Because even like, even like at a dollar a year, it's like $10 million of revenue. Like Google doesn't care about $10 million of revenue. <laughs> well, so the user base, I think, is also pretty important. Um, getting, uh, getting So Google is definitely doing very well in a lot of markets. But uh, for example, the Google apps, um, I know Maps and Gmail, et cetera, um, not all of them are as widely used in emerging markets uh, as they are in the first world. So kind of Google's footprint and kind of it's being a top of mind for users um, is probably a little lower in emerging markets and I, I think that's something that we're interested in as well. So if I may, Yeah. <laughs> okay, I lost me. <laughs> okay, uh, I have to chat more about it. Uh, yep. So the market share, have you, uh, do you have stacks of uh, market share for this app? And uh, had you estimated that before you won considering this app? Yeah, so, so again, like competition is, 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 is honestly not something that we look at very closely. Um, we try not to because that would also kind of limit how you see yourself, right? Are we this kind of app? Are we that kind of app? Are we solving a more general problem, etc.? So if you're thinking about market share in terms of there's this many apps out there that do this and we're X percent of that market, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I wouldn't really know. And I would actually try myself not to focus on it because it would limit my view to saying, oh, this is who we're competing with. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, but at least at some point you have to decide whether to launch it or not, or like whether to go for this product or not. And this kind of uh, thing probably helps us if yeah. uh, this is something already was probably decided that you're going to develop this app or product, then it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, it does, that didn't matter that much. What is important for us is the user base. Like if we can get to 100 million users, for example, that's a big thing. Um, what percentage of whatever market that may be, that doesn't really matter. Could we do one more question or is it? Final question. Okay. Yeah, you. Just a quick question. You started when you were working in finance. Yeah. Uh, you started like, working with the engineers. Is there a certain method you did to like, get the engineers like, working for free with you at nights? Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. They just like, on just like, So a lot of people kind of. Um, in whatever role, like working on new products that are kind of early ideas, you can sense all the time that people are very keen to do that kind of stuff. So um, that wasn't necessarily a big problem to try and find people that may be interested to spend a few hours a week trying to develop a new idea. Did you do any of the coding yourself? Or I didn't do any coding myself, no. I'm, uh, we have people that are a lot better at it than I am. All right, thank you.